For what you're about to hear, though I have a definite faith in my observations about our estuary, plus the fact that research often varies like size, lifespan, and even coloration from place to place, or estuary to estuary as it would be, nothing should be taken as written in stone, except one thing. Though obviously edited, every photo of every organism in this program and any other program I create is an actual organism of the Barnegat Estuary. And that's important because it gives our estuary a specific identity. These are the most common forage fish you're going to find in the saline waters of the Barnegat Estuary. While some are merely juveniles taking advantage of the estuary as a nursery for its rich food chains and protection, like the moss bunker, mullet, heron, others like the killie family, spearing and sticklebacks are year-round residents. And though none will grow much larger than six inches in a single season, by the end of that season, they're going to represent tons and tons of biomass and an indispensable link between the primary producers, like grasses and plankton, from which they've grown, and the major predators that depend on them for existence and growth, like striped bass, bluefish, wheatfish, wading birds, shorebirds, almost everything we hold dear about the estuary. And each has its own individual description. First, the most common fish you're ever going to catch in a seine net, the Atlantic silver sides, Manidia manidia, commonly called spearing. Has a pearl belly, translucent tail, and a silver band that runs the length of the lateral line, for which it's named. Lives two years, reaches a length of six inches. But it's not the only silver sides in the estuary. Often overlooked, there's also the inland silver sides, or Manidia barolinia. Similar in appearance to the Atlantic silversides, but seems to favor the lower salinities of the tributaries. Reaches a size of 4 inches, distinguishable by a shorter, broader anal fin with 16 rays, rather than the 24 to 26 rays of the Atlantic silverside. Then there's the white mullet, Eugucurima. Swims in from the continental shelf as larva. Has a thick, elongated, silvery white body with a bluish-green back. Though it may live 19 years and reach a size of 20 inches or more, only its first season will be spent in our estuary growing from a larva to adulthood at about 8 inches. Larval moss bunkers too swim in from the open ocean. Have a large head with a spot behind their gills, a wide compressed body, greenish back, and spotted silver sides. Grow from a mere 10 millimeters when they arrive to about 5 inches when they leave. Have a lifespan of eight years and may eventually grow to 15 inches or more. The first cousin of the moss bunker, the alewife heron, Alosa pseudoharangus, also spend their first season in our estuary. But unlike the moss bunker, they're born here in our tributaries. Silvery in color with a grayish green back, have a wide compressed body with a small tapered head and tail, and a sharp fluted belly. Live nine or ten years, may reach a size of 13 inches but will only grow to a possible five inches when they leave the bay in the fall. But unfortunately, their historically immense numbers have decreased to dangerously low numbers. Next, the most common forage fish you probably won't catch many of in a same, the common killie, or as it's often called a mummy chug, Bundlocetrophytus. The most numerous of the five species of the killie family that I've found here favors the less hospitable habitats of muddy inshore trenches and mosquito ditches, has a broad head and body with a compressed tail. Adult males in breeding coloration have yellow bellies and fins with black and white speckles and bars like the one in this picture. While the females are more of a drabish brownish or greenish with a few dark bars on the side. Live about four years, reach sizes of four to six inches, but they occur throughout the estuary all year long, never leaving the bay. Though not as numerous as the mummy chug, the striped killie, Fundalus majalis, is by far the largest of the family, having actually been recorded at almost 8 inches. Has a more streamlined shape with a flat tapered head and flat stomach. Has horizontal stripes in the female and vertical bars in the male with a yellowish coloration in the springtime. But because they favor higher salinities and sandy bottom, you're really only going to catch them in our lower estuary. Because it's similar in appearance to juvenile mummy chugs, and favors the same habitat. The rainwater killie, Luciana parva, often gets overlooked, when in fact it represents one of the smallest members of the killie family. Though said to reach two inches, I've never seen them any larger than an inch and a quarter. Brownish in color, with a more compressed body than mummy chugs, 
and males often show orange-colored fins like the one in the picture. But the dead giveaway for the rainwater killie is a large dark scale pattern you won't see in common killies. The most attractive member of the killie family is the sheep, said Minnow, Cyprinodon variegatus. Deep bodied with a maximum size of two inches or more, although again, I've never seen him any bigger than an inch and a quarter. Show dark rectangular bars on a silvery white body with a dark olive back on non breeding males and females, but breeding males light up like a Christmas tree with bright steel blue shoulder and body and fins mixed with yellow and orange. Lifespan of maybe three years, a great aquarium fish. Favors the same general insure habitat as mummy chugs and rainwater killies. The banded killie, Bunglus diaphanus, seem to show their greatest numbers in the lower salinities of our tributaries, brackish waters, or middle estuary. Though often confused with common killies, the mummy chug, their more streamlined body and flat tapered head can tell them apart pretty good. Both males and females show a series of dark vertical bars over a yellowish coloration and a dark olive back. But breeding males, like other members of this family, light up with beautiful shades of yellow, green, and blue, like the one in this photo. Grow to about five inches, live approximately four years. The most unusual forage fish, the four-spined stickleback, Apeltes quadracus, is the most numerous of two sticklebacks I found in our estuary, the other being the three-spined stickleback. Favors shallow, grassy bottoms, so it's often caught in the same with the other forage fish we already mentioned. Has a fairly compressed, fusiform shape, with a sharply tapered head and caudal peduncle. That's the base of the tail. Overall brown body, molted with black spots and cream to yellow belly and chin. Up to four sharp dorsal spines on the back, obviously give it its name. Grow to a little over two inches, live about three years. Last, but not necessarily least, the bay anchovy, anchoa michelli. Often called rainfish for the habit of dippling the surface of the water like raindrops. Known to be the most numerous forage fish of the middle Atlantic estuaries, but being immensely outnumbered by Atlantic silversides, that just doesn't seem to be the case in the Barnegat estuary. At best, their appearance in numbers each year is inconsistent. Have an elongate, laterally compressed body of medium depth with a blunted nose and a long upturned lower jaw. Except for a silvery head, belly, and lateral line, they're pretty much translucent with a slight reddish tint. Have a similar life cycle as an Atlantic silverside, live two years, reach a size of four inches, though they're only going to make it to two inches by the time they leave the estuary in the fall. Now, are there other forage fish in the bay? Of course there are. Not to mention invertebrate forage like crabs, clams, shrimp, worms, all primary and secondary consumers too. But we're talking about forage fish here, and I see two different kinds. Species of opportunity. No predator is going to pass up a free meal. And foundation species, that are, as the word implies, the fundamental link to the historical populations of major predators that depend on them. And these are, I believe, most of those fundamental species. But they all have their own individual life cycles and importance. Take, for example, what's probably the most important of these species, the Atlantic silversides, what we commonly call sparing, what I like to call our ultimate forage fish. With a two-year lifespan, the young of last year, which are now five to six-inch adults, begin their yearly exodus into the bay around the end of February. For the next few months, these massive concentrations will slowly circulate the estuary, moving throughout the bay, up into the tributaries, and back again, breeding as they go. Then, by the end of June, early July, they make their exodus back out of the bay, back to the inlet surf and ocean. But they leave behind the young of the year. Now for the rest of the season, these massive populations will dominate the lower and middle Barnegat estuary. At only three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half, when the breeders left, by the flood tides of late August and September, reaching a size of three to three and a half inches, they'll create backlogs in stage and areas near inlets so great that they actually roar like a rainstorm. Then they too make their exodus into the inlet surf and ocean. And though they're still going to remain numerous, possibly right into December, depending on water temperature, that's a life cycle of our ultimate forage fish. Now, you could say that their life cycle represents everything we need to know about them. But there are two conditions of existence in our estuary and every place else, actually. You're either alive or you give life to something else. And you can't disconnect the two. And that's the fundamental definition of a food chain. Now, let's see how the life, silver side's life cycle fits into that food chain.
For any forage fish, there's three things on your mind. A food source, self-defense, and a habitat to breed. And with the coming of spring, estuaries are that place. The water's warm, grass beds grow, and most important, nutrients and plankton explode. The spearing now have their food source. Now, they're said to reach as much as six inches, though most may be more like four to five inches, but think about it for a second. It's spring. What other forage fish are there of this size in massive schools that circulate throughout the water column of the low and middle estuary at this time of year? There aren't any. They now become the major food source for the third level of the food chain, what's called, commonly called tertiary consumers, that now follow them into the bay. The most important of which, for me at least, are the most visible, are commercial and recreational fisheries, like striped bass, bluefish, and weakfish. 